Hi, and welcome to Empower Together. I am your host, Desiree Parker, and I am super excited about today's guest. Um, I have Dr. John DeGarmo. He is the director of the Foster Care Ex Institute. He is a an author of a bunch of books. <laughs> he is an internationally renowned foster care expert, a TEDx speaker. He has um, spoken on foster care to I would say probably millions of people at this point between being on CNN, Good Morning America, Fox News, PBS, NBC, CBS, um, keynote speaker at all kinds of different conferences. In fact, I think he just got back from being a keynote speaker at a conference. Um, okay. Where was this one? Was this, I know you were in Philadelphia recently. This one was in Virginia. Virginia. Okay. So not too far from home for you. Awesome. Well, actually, no, that is a little bit far from home for me. I was trying to think, I'm like, I don't know why I'm sitting here thinking, I'm like, you're on the East Coast, but you're not on the East Coast. Well, I'm in Georgia, so it was a, you know, two hour flight. Okay, that's, that's not too bad. So um, you're also a foster parent yourself and uh, doing that for a really long time. Um, you've had like oh, what over 60 kids come through your home as foster children and have adopted out of the foster care system which i think is amazing um and uh so yeah i'd love to ask you some questions and sure thank you know, for the opportunity th absolutely thank you for coming on uh so just to start with um having worked just a little bit in the foster care system myself you know just for a couple of years i know uh firsthand what a difficult uh, job it is just just to work on the you know CPA side and in the faucet and in an RTC but um, you've kind of covered all the bases when it comes to foster care including you know being a foster parent um, what started all of this your journey what what made you make this your life's work Thanks for asking. There were two incidences that uh, really propelled me, if you will. Um, and and I must preface it by saying I never planned on doing any of this because I really had uh, a lot of misconceptions about foster care that most people do. So the first uh, incident was the death of my first child, which uh, my wife had, our first child had a condition called anencephaly or some pronounce it anencephaly. It's a condition where the brain never truly forms. And my wife was in labor for 92 hours. Oh my gosh, I can't even imagine. Yeah, so I turned my back on a lot of things at that point. And then years later, I started teaching in a rural school back in the United States. We were living in Australia earlier, where my wife is from. And I noticed a lot of kids coming through my classroom had issues of attendance, behavior, and academics. And I noticed it was really starting in the home. At the same time, there was at that time the largest human trafficking ring in the nation happening in that community, about 20 minutes from my home, um, led by Dr. Malachi York with the Nuwabian Nation. He was transporting about a thousand kids over the state line for purposes of, of, of child sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I asked my wife, hey, we lost our first child. There are kids in my classroom. There's kids in this community who need help. What if we, what if we became foster parents? And that really uh, started the whole thing, if you will. Wow. Okay. That's, um, that's a lot. That's a lot to, um, you know, endure before you even get to. <laughs> before you even get to the journey of foster care, you know. Um, so you started uh, started the foster care journey, and I know it's a difficult process too, just getting licensed. Right. Um, so you went through the whole process of getting licensed as a foster parent, and um, yeah, what was that journey like? Um, I've, I've dealt with, dealt with uh, people on that side of it too, and um, sometimes it can be a real, you know, beast. <laughs> Well, the, uh, the, I think the most interesting part of the journey was we thought we were ready. We had three healthy kids at that point. I've been teaching high school for a while, both in Australia and, and in Georgia, and had some experience in Michigan as well. And, and my wife had a degree in psychology, and we thought we were ready. And I recognized within 20 minutes of my first placement, I'm not ready for this. I, my training <laughs> did not prepare me for this. So, um, you know, our first few placements were really uh, eye-openers, if you will. And then I eventually got my doctorate center on foster care and said the foster care students started training other foster parents to be better equipped um, and child welfare workers as well to be better equipped as well. That's great. Um, 
because yeah, I, I definitely can see how, um, as a foster parent, you would definitely see where those holes are, um, and definitely see where um, the need is with those children that you brought in. Um, did you, were you licensed at like, uh, at least I know in Texas, uh, the children are, are uh, leveled at, uh, you know, like basic, moderate, specialized, intense. Is, is that pretty universal? It is. And although okay. those differ from state to state, but it is. And, and we were taking in at that point, anything, any, any child that needed help. In that okay. Okay. So primary medical needs, all of that kind of stuff. Yes, but we do. But every time we get a, a, a place, a phone call for a placement, we do ask ourselves, at this time, are we able to prepare, give the child the support services a child needs? Is this a good fit for our child, for our family right now? Is our family a good fit for this child right now? Is there anything that might prevent us from, from caring for this child at this point right now? So, you know, we every placement is is uh, we have to reevaluate. Our, at this time, are we equipped to take care of this child? And That's sometimes correct. the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is no. Absolutely. Um, I think that's something that a lot of parents struggle with, foster parents struggle with, is if I say no, are they not going to call me again? Right. Um, I, I definitely got that question from parents. Um, well, if I turn this down, are they going to never call me again? Um, and no, that's not the case, of course. Um, right. Right. Uh, yes. We want the child to go to the right home. Um, and we want the child to be a good fit for your family as well as for the child. Right. Right. So, yeah. Um, so how many years has this been now that you've seen 60 plus children come through your house? Uh, I believe we're going on 22 years now. Wow. That's amazing. That's truly amazing. Um, what made you, um, start going and speaking out and um, I know you started you said you started the foster care institute um, but what really made you think like this is widespread this is um, not just a local issue this is not just um, a few kids here and there falling through the cracks or not getting the services that they need what what made you realize like this is a bigger problem than just what I'm seeing with the kids sure. that I'm dealing with Great question. My doctorate, uh, my doctorate was centered around at that. My, my, my doctoral dissertation focused on at the time I was teaching high school and I recognized that my, when I became a foster parent, that I recognized that my fellow teachers had no clue about helping kids in foster care in the classroom because there's no training on it whatsoever. So most teachers are at a loss, you know, what's foster care. They believe the misconceptions this child must be acting out because he is whatever it might be. So my dissertation was bringing together teachers, foster parents and caseworkers together to help the children because 55% will drop out of school when they age out of the system. And on average, a child in foster care is 18 months behind academically, struggling with reading and math skills and has the issue of behavior or, or, or an array of behavioral issues. Mm -hmm. So I started noticing at them during the dissertation. And then when I finished my dissertation, I loved writing so much. I started writing some books and then I started getting asked to speak at events across the country. And that's when I started noticing that so many foster parents across the country simply are not equipped. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I definitely realized that as a, um, uh, I spent some time as a clinical case manager. So um, going out from, a, from the, the child placement agency to homes, um, that had some of the higher need kids, the primary medical needs and the, um, the kids that had higher level um, levels of care. So uh, a lot of them, you're right, they didn't have the, uh, the tools really that were necessary, the training in um, the kind of trauma that the kids had been through or, um, you know, what kind of labels these kids might've had placed on them because so many, I mean, they come with it seems like just this long list of um, disorders <laughs> that have been put on them. Uh, and what it really boils down to so much of the time is um, developmental disorder, really. Yes. I mean, it's, it's you know, just um, years of, of bouncing um, from unstable environment to unstable environment. Right. Um, right. And I don't know if that's something you, you know, um, kind of found as well. Well, each time a child goes from home to home, to home known as multiple displacement, 
they suffer from uh, further for issues of attachment and trust. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, definitely saw that working in um, an RTC, you know, with teenagers who um, definitely tried their hardest not to form an attachment <laughs> um, and to distance themselves from any staff or um, counselors or, you know, case managers, anybody there um, that tried to form relationships with them. They really tried to push away um, because they knew it was temporary. Sure. You know, and um, didn't want to uh, have that have that bond broken eventually that they knew, you know, when they knew it was coming. Um, so uh, what would you say one of the hardest things um, about being a foster parent has been over all these years? Well, probably the same thing most foster parents suffer from, and that's feelings of grief and loss and child leaves their home. You know, in my house and so many other foster parents' homes, there's no label, there's no biological, there's no adoptive, there's no, there's no um, foster. They're all our children. They're parts of our family. And we love them unconditionally because they need someone to love them all their hearts. So when they leave, for whatever reason it might be, foster parents experience a time of grief and loss because it's like losing a member of our family. So that is challenging to be sure. Foster parents also experience something known as secondary traumatic stress or compassion fatigue. I love that word, compassion, fatigue, fatigue, mm -hmm. exhaustion from compassion, from caring so much. Uh, so, so that has been tough as well. Yeah, I can only imagine. I can. Only and then when you bring children to your home who have a number of anxieties, whether it's or disorders, eating disorders, sleep anxiety, anger management issues, reactive attachment disorder, whatever it might be, mm -hmm. attachment mm -hmm. trust. That's tough too for the family dynamics. So, you know, it's, oh, yeah. it's a, it's a it's a challenging lifestyle. I call it a lifestyle because it's different than any other form of parenting. It doesn't even come close. At the same time, it's the most rewarding thing I've ever done by far, by far. Yeah, that's that's definitely um, what I've heard from foster parents as well, um, that um, they do it for years and years and years, despite all of the uh, difficulties and the heartaches and um, you know, the loss that comes from a child leaving the home. Um, you know, tell me about your experiences dealing with biological families, um, because I know a lot of the times with foster parents also have to, t um, interact with, um, a biological family of a foster child who still has parental rights, um, and visitation and contact, um, and how, either beneficial in some cases or disruptive in other cases um, that that can be. Because I know that's, that's a, a big struggle sure. for a lot. Right, right. And it has been challenging for me too. We've, we have faced those false accusations and false allegations and we've been fouled in cars and spat upon and threatened. But at the end of the day, I have to remind myself that for so many of these birth parents, they're suffering their own pain, their own trauma own anxiety that they never ever got professional therapy or counseling for for example we have care for a couple of kids who are third generation foster care which means their parents and grandparents were also in the system and their birth mother is prostituted out by age nine by her father 10 to 12 times a day so there's no possible way that yeah. she could parent her own kids and she never got the professional help and therapy that she desperately desperately needs to this day to this day Absolutely. Um, and it's just so heartbreaking um, sure, sure. to see. It's just a cycle. It's a generational cycle for so many. So, so it's important for foster parents to keep that in mind that, you know, as a, if the birth parent is attacking me in some fashion, there's no way I should be taking it personal because it has nothing to do with me. They are in pain. They are suffering in some, in some way, and they're just lashing out. They don't, they're, they're, they're burdened with emotions that they can't simply process or, or deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's hard to um, deal with that with the children as well. Um, you know, to, to be sometimes, unfortunately, that bridge um, between, you know, what they're experiencing with the biological family and then also what they're experiencing in your home um, and the questions they're asking about, you know, why can't I go home or, um, 
you know, mitigating some of that behavior that uh, changes after maybe a home visit. Um, and then and then they return completely dysregulated or, you know, something like that. And um, when, especially with the younger children that maybe don't have all the facts of why they're not at their home. Um, so that can be really difficult, I know, for a lot of foster parents as well. Um, being, you know, that the bearer of that information, but not being able to uh, convey that in a um, in a way that a say four or five year old could understand. Right. Right. So, um, I know that makes it difficult. Yes, to be sure. To be sure. Yeah. Uh, so, what are some of the biggest, I, I guess I'd say, foster parenting questions uh, that you get when you when you go out and speak and, and talk to other foster parents? Yeah, foster parents want to know how they can get the support services they need when they're caring for children. You know, they're, they're looking for caseworkers and child welfare workers for help, but in truth, our child welfare workers or caseworkers are overworked, overwhelmed, under-resourced, under-supported, and understaffed, and underpaid, and they simply do not have the the ability to to give the foster parents the help they need when they are so overwhelmed with court visitations, paperwork, meetings, etc. So foster parents are desperate for support. Um, they're desperate for community as well because no one understands a foster parent like another foster parent. As I said earlier, it is so far different than normal parenting. So my friends and family members have no true understanding of what it's like caring for a child in your house 24 hours a day seven days a week who is filled with anxiety who has issues of trust and attachment who is looking at my wife and i as who are these people um so they foster parents uh look for that you know marriage and foster parents often request a session i do marriage can be stressed well all marriages encounter stress at some time at some point but then again when you put a whole mix in there of is with anxiety in there that can be a strain in a marriage as well um those are just probably probably the top ones that that foster parents will for help for okay yeah the parenting and uh oh and then parenting. there's the also social media aspect too i i one of my books is called keeping foster children safe online i believe the most relevant issue facing foster care today is the dangers associated with online technology and social media because some of these kids go online looking for they're looking for normalcy. They're looking for a, a feeling of normalcy that they're not getting. And they're also looking for acceptance. And the predators out there recognize these vulnerable children and lure them in with false hopes, false promises. And then so many that end up victims of human trafficking. And that really escalated during COVID. Yes. During COVID. When we as a society chose to, uh, well, when society embraced the fear and shut down all the schools. And here I was saying, can't shut the schools down because of these schools from these kids when you have five million five million children in the united states who experience domestic violence in their own home what we're doing is we're locking them in the home with their abuser and there's no mandated reporter who's going to be able to see that there's well, no intentions are escalating yes yes and and and, and yeah and um providing so these kids, stress these, these kids are not getting any type of help. They're locked in their house with their abuser. And they were going online looking for help. Yeah. Um, and we know also now that those kids were not doing their schoolwork online. They were doing everything else but that. And that's why we have, that's why we're going to have a whole generation of children who are going to be so far behind academically. Pandemic learning loss, as it's known yeah. by. Um, I had a high schooler uh, who was in, uh, well, I mean, she was in her, I think, sophomore sophomore year by the time the pandemic hit and fortunately was, you know, motivated and, and is in college now. But um, I think about uh, friends that had, you know, um, elementary and middle school kids who just, who, who, I mean, they weren't engaged. They weren't engaging at all. Um, and there was, there was a, or, or kids that even that started school Oh, they're, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're, kindergarten. Their vocabulary is behind, their reading is behind, their math is behind, their social skills are behind at that early, early age, language development by far. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 
Um, I was still working in um, anti-trafficking when COVID hit. Um, and that's primarily my background is um, working with uh, survivors of trafficking. So we definitely saw uh, just uh, an explosion in need. And of course, a um, even bigger lack of, of uh, resources than usual uh, because nobody would take in any uh, new people. <laughs> Right, right. And there were so many people like myself who were out there saying, this is the wrong thing to do. We can't lock these kids in the homes. We can't be social distancing. We can't. I said in April of 2020 on so many TV interviews, I, at, at that point when it was just starting, I said, I am far more concerned about the mental health aspects than I am about any virus. And we are seeing all that come to fruition now. Teenage suicide attempts up 70 percent in yeah. girls since COVID, teenage addiction, teenage obesity, teenage depression, teenage anxiety, all these are so much higher than they were before COVID. And that all could have been prevented. We're definitely dealing with some ugly after effects. Um, that could have been prevented. That, right. that, yeah, ended up, you know, we ended up with a, um, essentially a global trauma. Um, you know, with, with the lockdowns and, and all of that stuff that, um, and, and all the fear that, that that produced um, over the course of, you know, nearly two, you know, probably two years um, right. that people were afraid, you know, and um, yeah, I think, I think it could have been avoided. <laughs> well, think about that two yeah, or three year old child. Way. Think about that two or three, two, between all oh, three, four or five year old child who's told, don't touch grandma. You could kill grandma. Don't hug me. You yeah. could hug me. I mean, the, the anxiety yeah. that we place upon these children. And again, I was saying this is not the right step. This is. Yeah. But again, I was looked upon as, oh, you know, hope it's going to kill everybody. Well, I know. And I, yeah. Are, are disastrous. It's so yeah. sad. It's so sad. It's happening to these children. Um, because I know. They yeah and um in the line of work that we you know are um and and working you working with foster kids and me at, at the time working with um victims of trafficking and going into an rtc working with with foster kids who had been trafficked um we were essential you know workers and so um you can't convince kids to wear masks and social distance and all of that stuff in a, um, well, I'll tell know. you a little secret here. My wife and I made the decision in April, 2020, that we were going to live a normal lifestyle for our kids. So we didn't do the masks either. We didn't do the social distancing either because we had, uh, we, we saw, we looked in the future and thought, what is this going to do for the mental health of our child? And my wife as a doctor of nutrition was saying to me, you know, this virus is not that bad. Not that the media is, is, and we're seeing that now. We're seeing that now. Um, so we made that conscious decision. And my kids lived as normal a lifestyle as possible. And I truly can see the difference mm -hmm. between those children at that young age who are the same age as my kids when it comes to speech, when it comes to learning, when it comes to social interaction with other, each other, when it comes with anxiety, when it comes to fear. Yeah. Because, you know, globally, the world was encased in fear. It was. And we didn't, it, we chose to, we chose to, uh, we didn't choose that path of fear. Yeah. That, and that, I mean, if you study trauma, of course, you know what that does to a brain. And, right, right, um, right. and it's not. Uh, well, so many of our legislators don't, don't think of that that bad. Yeah. It just, it's not a healthy thing. So. And then um, when it comes to foster care, you know, when you're placing these children, when you're, when you're, when they are no longer in school, they're not getting the school services they need. They're not getting the professional therapy or counseling services they need. They're not getting in-person visitation services they needed. And they're locked home 24 hours a day and their anxiety levels went through the roof. Mm -hmm. Well, foster parents are saying, I'm not a teacher. I'm not a professional therapist or counselor. I can't do visitations five days a week online. And there's no caseworker to help me because of social distancing. Their anxiety levels went to the roof as well. Oh. And we lost a lot of good foster parents. Yes. During those two years. Yes. I, I can only imagine um, how many people closed their homes. Correct. Um, Correct. And, um, you know, just 
uh, couldn't take the pressure anymore. Um, and I know here in Texas, um, and this is, you know, unrelated to COVID, just uh, the state of our foster care system is not good. Um, and there's just been a lot of uh, group homes, residential treatment centers, stuff like that, that have closed down. And so we've lost um, the beds um, for foster children um, over the last few years. Um, and well, you can, have, look at, you can look at nationwide and you continue to see stories week after week of children sleeping in hotels, children sleeping in offices. That's and what we have, CWAP, children right. without placement. And that's because there's not enough homes these children be placed in. Um, mm -hmm. And that's part of, that's, that's just part of what happened as a result of, of 2020. Yeah. yeah, and it is, it's, it's um, what's, uh, what's hard about it is the teenagers almost prefer it though um because they can come and go as they please and um we end up with that them then homeless before 18. correct so correct. right um so yeah it's a disturbing it to incarceration drugs a whole human yeah. trafficking yes. mental health whole array of issues yeah so um I really appreciate that you um, spend so much time and so much effort and put so much work into educating people, um, you know, putting out books, uh, going and speaking, having these conferences, having these trainings for parents and um, CPS and law enforcement, you know, all of these people to help them to understand, you know, the importance of being a foster parent. Um, I know you have a huge group on on Facebook of foster parents that are able to provide one another with support and ask questions and things like that. Um, and I see them able to, you know, come together and answer those questions for each other or give resources to each other. Um, and, you know, that's just incredibly helpful. Um, so I just really Think that's a great way to help empower those people um and and bring this in front of them um thank you thank you very driven if you saw my ted talk you know why i'm driven daily to do i did i did um uh, if you haven't seen uh, dr john's ted talk um you should um it's a, a tedx from uh, michigan state um georgia tech georgia tech i don't but I'm a Michigan State guy. So, like, I'm all so, over the place. I'm all over the no, place. No, I am. I, my heart is <laughs> the so, so you got that right. You're absolutely right. So but, but yes, if you find, uh, if you search um, John DeGarmo on um, YouTube, you will see. Or if you go to his website, uh, LinkedIn, any of that stuff, he um, his TED Talk is there. And it is a great talk. Um, mm -hmm. And it is... Um, you know, emotionally charged. It gives a great insight into his passion and the brokenness and difficulty of navigating the system um, when it comes to uh, trying to get care for a foster child. Um, and um, especially those that, you know, well, they all really need it, quite honestly. <laughs> um, but some of those that have um, that really difficult need. So um, I just really appreciate it. And um, I'm so glad that you were able to take the time to speak with me. And, um, you know, I'm glad to know you and that you work in this space. Um, and I appreciate all the time that, um, you know, that we're able to talk and you're able to share all the interesting things that you do and, and wonderful my things pleasure, that you do. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Absolutely. So um, thank you again. And this is Dr. John DeGarmo. Please um, look him up, find his website, find his books. Um, he has great books. He has great talks. And um, this is, again, your host, Desiree Parker. And um, thank you for listening to Empower Together. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Bye.